Uh, hi. Uh, good morning. Thank you to the Botsdieber Foundation and to Monique and Stephanie for organizing this, and thank you all for coming this morning. Um, I've been asked to talk specifically about managing wild horses with PZP, and other speakers will speak about other agents as the morning and the, the day goes on. Um, I think most stakeholders share a certain set of objectives with respect to wild horse management. Um, healthy rangelands um, is par are paramount, which implicitly requires a sustainable number of livestock and a sustainable number of wild horses. Um, and we're also all interested in cost efficient management. And as, as Sherry said uh, previously, removing and warehousing wild horses from the range uh, and putting them in holding facilities and paying to take care of them is not good for taxpayers and it's not good for horses. We don't, we don't imagine that horses actually belong there. Um, and the other thing I will add is that biologists typically work cheaper than lawyers and so some extra investment in um, data collection and planning and modeling um, might um, be economical in the long run. So I also have a personal vision for, wa for wild horse management, um, so we'll put that up front. Um, I share the ecological interests in, in healthy rangelands, healthy wildlife populations, um, preventing overgrazing and other sorts of environmental damage. Um, I have strong humane interests, and, and, um, and the number one interests are in preventing mass starvation and needless suffering, which I think probably most of the public shares. Um, I also have my own personal ethical viewpoint, which is based on my own field work with horses and my own personal sense that, that they're wildlife. Um, they're not really like domestic horses and they really belong in the ra on the range and therefore um, they should be allowed to live as freely as possible on their home territory. Um, so, I know this is like, this seems like super elementary and I don't want to patronize anybody, but we really need to focus on all the things that affect wild horse population size. Um, so remember that, you know, basic intro bio, the changes in population depend on birth rates and death rates, immigration and emigration, right? So all those things matter in terms of regulating population size. And so if we're thinking about reducing or stabilizing wild horse populations, we have to think about balancing all those elements. Um, as practiced, most emigrations for wild horses essentially um, are, are, are removals. Um, and removing horses is somehow like deeply satisfying. It makes you feel like you're doing something um, in the same way that in my, my deer world, people like to see hunters dragging carcasses out of the woods. Um, but that's not the same thing as population reduction. It's just one piece of what's needed to actually, um, again, stabilize or reduce the population. And so for the wild horse program, the adoption and removal program has been going on for 45 years. There have been some good years, there have been some bad years, but the overall cumulative effect is that births have consistently exceeded removals. This has been going on for a long time, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, where the adoption program has, has slowed and there have been other sorts of economic and, and logistic pressures on the, on the Bureau so that births have kept coming and removals have not kept pace. And that's not going to change. I think it's fair to say that's not going to change unless we also do something about birth rates. Okay. So we need to look at both sides of that inequality there. So again, I've been asked to talk about um, PZP um, and most of you are familiar with PZP um, as, as again, Sherry alluded to, um, Jay and, and John and Erwin Liu have been working on that since the late 1980s. Um, it's been around for a long time. Uh, we know it pretty well. Um, it's a protein, again, extracted from pig ovaries, right? And because it's, it's a protein, it's not, um, it, it is biodegradable and it's, con and it's destroyed in digestion, so it doesn't have some of the sorts of effects that steroids, uh, synthetic steroids have. Um, we like it as an agent because it is highly targeted at the zone of pellucida protein, and there's nothing else in mammals that looks like zone of pellucida protein, so you don't have to worry about 
um, about autoimmune responses, um, and it specifically targets fertilization, right? Um, we've been using this on probably 100 plus species now for decades. We know a lot about it. Uh, we know it doesn't hurt the animals that are treated. We know that mares that are treated with, uh, with PZP um, will have perfectly healthy foals. Um, and again, we've got decades of data on that. Um, there are effects on, on social behavior, but they're extremely modest um, that are mostly related to the fact that females that are treated don't have foals and that females without foals behave a little differently than females with foals. Um, but we haven't seen any large scale disruption of social behavior associated with this. They still live in the same normal sorts of groups that they live in. Um, three PZP preparations that, that, that are out there. Um, I will work mostly on, I will talk about one and two, the native PZP, which is the basic acetate fire island simple emulsion vaccine that was registered with uh, EPA as zone of stat H. So the original requirement, the protocol for that is two initial shots, at least four weeks apart, um, and then annual boosters to maintain effectiveness. Um, and then I'll talk about PZP-22, um, which is the same native PZP plus control release PZP pellets. And, and John Turner will talk a lot more about, about that in his talk later on this afternoon. Um, but the idea of the concept behind PZP-22 was to build a time release structure that would essentially simulate PZP boosters and, and, um, and therefore produce a longer acting effect with one, with one shot. Spayback is, is, is out here as well. Mark Fraker is here, um, uh, which is a single tra treatment preparation using a proprietary liposome packaging. Um, of the PP PCP antigen, and there's really good data from captive horses and from other animals as well. But at this point, uh, speaking to the topic of this um, of, of this workshop, there aren't any published data on free roaming wild horses or remote delivery or population effects. So I'm not going to talk about it. Um, so PZP can be delivered either with um, hand injection or by dart. Either preparation, we know at this point, both the primers and the boosters um, can be delivered either by hand or by dart. And I'll talk a little bit about those data. Um, the darting um, for herds that can be darted, um, there are now lots of examples of small-ish, small to medium-sized wild horses that are controlled largely with PZP through darting. Um, and a lot of, some of those are East Coast Barrier Islands, some of them are some of the, the Western herds as well. And often some sort of trapping is also used, bait trapping is used to access the horses for, for treatment or darting. Um, but there's lots, to c there, there are plenty of examples at this point, um, and probably it, it behooves the agencies to spend a little bit more time identifying other herds that might be suitable for darting. Um, but of course that's not the, the main challenge. The main challenge um, for the bulk of, of BLM and Forest Service horses is large HMAs and wild horse territories uh, where, free, where darting free roaming wild horses isn't feasible, either because the territories or the HMAs are too large or the horses are too wary or there are other sorts of logistic obstacles that keep people from getting close to wild horses efficiently. So back in 2008, um, HSUS, with a huge grant from the Annenberg Foundation, um, began a study of which came out to be three, um, three different field sites um, with the goals of, of looking not so much at, at vaccine efficacy, but at population effects and health effects and behavioral effects of PZP22. And kudos to Kayla who did and oversaw almost all of this and we'll be hearing from Kayla later on. So I have to make sure that she gets her her um, props for this. Um, but we ended up working at, at three areas. Um, and we did end up looking at efficacy, um, which was fortunate that we did. Um, so we were interested in PZP-22 for all of these sites and whether PZP-22 could actually be used effectively to control populations. And so, but we also looked at individual level efficacy and it turned out that the efficacy of the primers of PZP-22 didn't match that of the efficacy that had been seen in the Clan Alpine studies that, that John 
and other folks published a little bit earlier, which showed at least two and maybe a third year of efficacy for a single shot. Um, it was not quite so good there. Um, and so there was pretty good first year efficacy. Um, the efficacy depended on timing, very much so, which was a consequence of how the, the PZB22 was originally engineered. Um, so the worst efficacy was at Sandwash Basin, um, where a 2009 gather uh, was conducted in October, um, which is about as non-optimal as you can get for delivering PZP22. Cedar Mountains was a little bit better. Those were December treatments. And then there was a second gather at Cedar Mountains in February 2012, um, where the first year efficacy was really quite good. Um, in all the studies, the second year efficacy was not so great. There was also, um, and Karen will talk about this a little bit later, um, there was also a, um, a DART delivery of PZB22 carried out at, at Harita Mesa, Wild Horse Territory, right nearby. Um, those were delivered primarily in May, um, and the efficacy there was also extremely good um, in the first year. Not so bad for the second year either. So, um, so timing is everything. So first lesson here is that you have to think about in terms of when you're planning these kinds of things, um, when you're going to be delivering the vaccine, because it does matter. Um, the big surprise to us um, came with looking at the effectiveness of PZP boosters after PZP22 priming. So um, the, um, the sand in Sandwash Basin, they were delivered by DART um, starting in 20 fall of 2010. Again, not super optimal timing. Um, and the, the, um, the year zero, the control numbers are actually a little bit weird because those are actually animals that had been previously treated with PZB22. Those were, those were um, uh, third year animals in the case of Cedar Mountains and second year animals in the case of, of Sandwash Basin. So those, are a little bit, those numbers are a little bit lower than you would expect them to be for untreated animals. Um, but in both locations, with both hand injection and dart delivery, we got pretty extended contraception for those animals. So at least three years and maybe four at Cedar Mountains with the hand injection of the booster. Again, these are bo animals that were boosted after receiving the PZP22, um, two years after for San Wash Basin and three years after for Cedar Mountains. Um, and um, the efficacy for the, um, for the dark delivery was probably a little bit lower, again, possibly because of timing. Um, timing and other factors, but they were both conspicuously effective. And so the PZP boosters were delivered by DART at San Wash Basin in fall of 2010, um, by hand at Cedar Mountains in February of 2012, um, and, these, and these boosters lasted at least three years, which we didn't know. So we had no information at all about PZP 22 boosters. Um, and, and so that was very, um, that's very useful to know. Um, and there's some modeling that's been done on that, that basis, which we'll hear about later. Um, we boosted with both the native PZP, Zonostat H, or with PZP22, and the effectiveness between those two preparations didn't differ by much. So because PZP, native PZP is a lot cheaper, the protocol and the, the logical protocol in the field right now is um, it would be to, to boost with the native PZP, at least for now. And we're starting to see some of the same things with deer, which we're trying in New York. So anyway, um, for, for whatever reason, one of the places we worked at with that Kayla worked at was Cedar Mountains um, Herd Management Area in Utah. Um, this is a really, really hard place to work. And if you can control populations there, you can, you can, you can control them anywhere. Um, so it's a very large HMA. The most challenging piece of it um, is that number one, the horses are really wary, and number two, that there's a, it's, it's basically a donut and there's no vehicle access to a big chunk of the land in the middle, which meant that Kayla had to do a lot of her work on foot. Um, and so um, also there's some movement of the horses on and off Cedar Mountains onto the adjacent uh, Dugway um, Army, Re Army Reservation. So, um, so it's, it's a really challenging place. It has immigration, immigration. It has limited uh, vehicular access. It has super wary horses. And so, um, after some sort of 
preliminary attempts to do some darting there that was sort of abandoned. Um, and so Cedar Mountains has been managed by Gather. And um, the initial Gather in 2008, um, about half of the mares that were left in the herd after treatments and um, of, of the animals who were actually captured, there were only about half the animals had been treated. Um, or half of the mares that were left in the herd had been treated. A big chunk of the mares didn't come in, and so they were left untreated. Um, the 2012 gather um, was different. So BLM got about 80% of the mares there, or seven, rather seven, about 70% of the mares, um, removed about 100 horses, boosted about three quarters of the mares that had been previously treated, the ones that came in, and then primed a bunch of new mares with PZP22. So at the end of this gather, the herd was stable because they'd removed about 100 animals. Um, and, um, and a majority, a healthy majority of the animals, of the mares that were out there on the range had been treated. And the result of this is that the population was stable between 2011 and 2013. Um, in 2012, 2013, after the gather, population growth was only about 3.5% which seems like it would be well within the manageable range. So this is the same stuff in numbers. Pay attention to the, the yellow line more than the orange line. The orange line is the, um, is the actual wild horse numbers, um, and the yellow line is the percent of annual growth, which is the axis on the right. So um, peak um, population growth at between 2011 and 2012 was over 20%. At that herd, so remember that the efficacy of the primer was not very good after the first year, um, and so the population growth levels rebounded in the second year. But then, after the remo modest removals and the treatments um, in t between 2012 and 2013, the population growth rate completely plummeted. Um, and then it started to restore because many of the, again, we're dealing with 85 mares that had gotten a primer and in the second year the primer didn't work as well. Um, and so you started to get back up towards, uh, towards higher levels of population growth after that. Um, but still never achieved the, the peak numbers that had been seen in uh, 2011, 2012. So conclusions from the Cedar Mountain study. So if you keep 70% or more of the mares treated, that will sharply reduce population growth. You gotta get them, though. Um, there is, by the way, no rebound effect after contraception. This is something that just seems to circulate in the atmosphere that, oh, well, all these mares reproduce afterwards. They don't. It does not not actually work that way. Um, with current technology, I think that maybe three cycles of treatments um, would achieve that sort of annual growth rate of less than 5% um, if you keep those animals under treatment. Um, and that assumes that you're working with a primer that has lousy second and third year efficacy. If you can tinker, John, with the, with the pellets such that we can get that s those same numbers that we got at, at Clan Alpine, we're probably talking about two gather cycles to get your numbers down to your population growth to where it, it ought to be and, and would produce, again, maybe 5% population growth a year, which is probably something that could be dealt with. Um, so final thoughts. Again, after 45 years of taking horses off the range, um, this system has clearly collapsed. It's not going to be enough to use removals to get to AML. And that's, that's our interest. And again, as Sherry notes, we can argue about what AML should be, but it doesn't matter. If your population growth is, is high, it doesn't matter what you set AML at. You're gonna blow through it at some point. Um, second, um, we're gonna have to reduce birth rates as well as, as removals. Um, and, and again, the, the path that is advocated is to remove first get down to AML, and then apply fertility control. But I don't think that's gonna work. We haven't done it in most places. 
and that's because we're not treating enough animals. So if you do your removals first, you're gonna have a huge batch of mares still out there on the range who are still reproducing at you know, 60% a year. And so I just don't think that's gonna work. There are just gonna be too, ma too many untreated mares on the range. So if the real goal is to get down to AML, to get the populations under control, I don't think we're moving to AML first is gonna work. So, and again, John will elaborate on this a little bit more later, later this afternoon. Um, we need to think about reducing birth rates first and then using removals to get down to AML. Once you get the birth rates under control, then you can use the removals and start pushing them down. And, and it's possible that, as, that a hybrid sort of model that Cedars, Cedar Mountains pursued might be the best way to go, where there's some removals, but most animals are treated and returned until population growth is under control. So that's, those are my thoughts um, for, the, for the morning. And I wanna thank all my longstanding friends and colleagues at Science Conservation Center, Jay and Kim and, and Robin Lida, John and, and Irwin and, and Doug Flanagan who work with us, folks from the HSUS, and again, especially Kayla for, for doing all this damn work. And then um, the other folks who are involved, Heidi and Stephanie, um, Annenberg, Mount Taylor Mustangs, and Dan Elkins, who uh, were critical for the Hurita Mesa, um, Hurita Mesa study, and, and of course my colleagues at, at Tufts and the NIH, who's, who funded some of the um, some of the vet students who came out here and worked at Hurita Mesa. So, thank you. <laughs>